Anime is more than just Japanese dubbed animation. Part of the reasons why it has so many loyal fans is that it offers the viewer consistency in its tropes and culture. To make an analogy, the reason people love detective books written by multiple different authors is because they can expect some basic tropes and themes to make an appearance. For example, the unlikable but charismatic detective, or the killer playing cat and mouse game with him. Anime and manga are pretty much the same. Of course, there are multiple tropes associated with anime literary culture, and it depends on which genre or magazine you're reading, so today I will narrow down the scope by specifically discussing the action shonen genre and demographic. The one trope that seems to consistently appear in most popular shonen animanga is the pervert, the creep, the sexual harasser. Call them what you want, but you know exactly the type of character I'm talking about. If you search perfect character in shonen on Google, you will receive multiple links with the top 10 list. There are also similar compilations of pervy moments in anime on YouTube. This character is not only a common occurrence, but a legitimized device for R-rated comic relief. One of the most notorious creeps in shonen is Mineta from My Hero Academia. He is a short, funny-looking character with a silly superpower, and he is certainly not designed to be high up in the popularity ladder, let's say. Regardless of his goofy physicality, his personality is also difficult to defend. He is weak, insecure, a horrible fighting partner, and most importantly, he is a pervert. He constantly forces his sexual desires on his classmates, and he does anything to get an unsolicited peek of the girls' bodies. He also sexualizes any female entity around him, including young Eri, who is approximately 7 years old. If Mineta was my student or son, I would have to organize a serious intervention. But alas, no one intervenes to stop Mineta from harassing those around him. In fact, while most students look down on him, his shenanigans are still played off as a joke. Now, imagine how surprised I was to hear that Denji from Chainsaw Man was compared to Mineta on Twitter and TikTok. Am I here to destroy these people with facts and logic? Nah, I don't really care about every little opinion on the internet. But I wanted to make a video that would maybe help audiences differentiate between a character that is essentially a sexual offender and a character who is exploring his sexuality. Do not let conservative purity fool you. Being urgently interested in sex is not inherently perverted, nor a sign of bad character. There are other factors at play here that make a character cross that line. So in this video, I will do two things. One, I will explain why characters like Mineta exist and how they are harmful. And two, I will explain why I don't think Denji should be included in the same category. Before we get into it, trigger warning for mentions of SA and R word. Of course, nothing too detailed, but I wanted to warn just in case. Section 1. Mineta and sexual coercion in media. Comedy is theorized to have three main goals. Surprise the viewer with incongruous situations help the viewer escape restrictive social norms, and finally, understand social situations that they might relate to in a more humorous light. There are many ways to achieve those reactions, from shocking jokes to wordplay to absurdity. Therefore, humor is very important when we examine our personal beliefs and views. Because to laugh with something means that we understand it, and in fact, studies have shown that our humor is shaped by our real-life attitudes. For example, People who already possess an uncritical attitude and engage in hostile sexism tend to be the ones who actually find sexist jokes funny. They are not just laughing because sexism is absurd, they are laughing because they understand how it attacks a certain person and that is funny to them. In case you didn't know, hostile sexism describes an antipathy and antagonism against women who go against conservative gender assignments, for example being modest, obedient and attractive individuals. I say against women because sexism is more often manifested against women and non-men due to patriarchal oppression. And overall, gender assignments come from men's expectations, even the ones that oppress other men. So, characters like Mineta, the loser pervert, are a comedic device to engage the audience and make them laugh. The problem is what the audience is actually laughing at and why the humor can have real-life consequences on people's attitudes. So first of all, let's break down how Mineta is constructed as a character. Mineta is an external character. This means that we are not meant to identify with him or consider him an ideal mold of a person. You notice that he is not really part of the in-group characters in Class 1A, for example, Deku, Uraraka, Ida, Todoroki, and even Kirishima or Bakugo. He is an outsider, and there is little to no depth to his character as he is mostly there to fill in the class and unfortunately for comedic effect. Nevertheless, external characters are not superfluous. They are needed to further the plot and elevate the main characters by having the audience compare them to each other. Mineta is a creep, an external character whose whole shtick is sexually harassing women. Just to clarify, sexual harassment can include unwelcome sexual advances, verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature, and even requests for sexual favors. 
and in our world should be actionable. It should be looked down upon and discouraged societally and dealt with legally. So, of course, I will recognize that when Mineta sexually harasses a girl, we are not encouraged to idealize him and become him. However, the comedic purpose of his character and the way the scene plays out trivializes the harassment. As I mentioned earlier, nobody intervenes when Mineta does what he does. And I mean really intervene, not just make a condescending comment. Even the girls who are victimized by him tend to stand still and mildly scold him. There are no consequences for his behavior, at least no proportional consequences. In fact, the majority of sexual harassment portrayed in television takes place in situational comedies and not in works that might attempt to seriously address such behavior. One of the main reasons the behavior is so easily accepted as funny is due to the objectification of women. Women and young girls' bodies are often utilized as sexual devices, and the characters are stripped of their personhood in order to achieve that goal. You'll notice that when Mineta assaults one of the girls, they are unmoving, barely expressing themselves. That's because their function in those scenes is not to be a person, a character. It's to be a female body that Mineta wants. In addition, being objectified is more than just offensive and unsavory. It has real-life repercussions by encouraging victim-blaming rhetoric that renders girls responsible for the sexual victimization. If you think victim blaming is not common, then please refer to my sources in the description and read some of the relevant studies. There is a high percentage of victim blaming opinions that pervade, such as believing that women are asking to be R-worded or lied about the R-word being non-consensual. Other women can also express these attitudes and use themselves as an example of appropriate behavior to contrast the women who were asking for it. Even if there is no direct blaming, girls are told that being victimized is natural due to how tempting their good looks are and how weak boy self-control is. The rhetoric perpetuates the false idea that covering up body parts can help prevent sexual harassment. Of course, that does not work based on what we know about actual harassment, as there is no specific type of clothing associated with being victimized. Literally anyone and anywhere can be harassed. Also, it removes responsibility from the perpetrator and places it onto the victim. While the possible victim can obviously take precaution steps, true prevention cannot be achieved without re-educating our society to discourage possible perpetrators. And in the case of media characters like Mineta, no one is trying to re-educate them and they have no intention of changing. Another way the harassment is indirectly justified is by drawing the female characters in a very male gazy way, notably with fully developed chests and back areas. Of course, there are teenagers who have bodies like that, but the majority of adolescent girls do not. Such portrayals can have a detrimental effect on both the former and the latter. It encourages the sexualization of underage people and children, especially by adults, and it also contributes to a culture of insecurity and restrictive beauty expectations for women. Girls as young as 7 years old begin to judge themselves based on the male gaze ideal in media. Why would girls so young worry about what older men think of them? Another consequence of viewing objectifying media can be the viewers and specifically the male viewers' development of objectifying attitudes. Of course, watching problematic media does not immediately make you problematic. However, the younger the viewers are and the more content they watch, the likelihood to develop sexist beliefs increases. More specifically, male viewers who are uncritically engaged in such content are more likely to normalize objectifying language. That means that they might use it themselves or not react when others are doing it. So they participate in the objectification either by perpetrating it or by being a silent witness that allows it to occur. This process is not always conscious, and it can happen over time without realizing how much the content they are viewing is influencing their everyday behavior. When studies claim that sexist attitudes in media can lead to more SA, they don't just refer to more people going out and assaulting women. They also consider the people who fail to defend women from being victimized, either by turning a blind eye or being a silent witness to what is occurring. Lack of community support can also increase the rates of SA against anyone, regardless of gender identity. To finish off this section, this discussion is particularly important when you consider the healthy alternative we could have had. Portraying healthy consent practices in media and television can foster more positive gender attitudes in adolescent viewers, especially toward women who are often the victims of negative portrayals. The way I see it, little by little and starting by exposing young people to media that can properly address taboo topics, the outward culture that has defined our stories and communal attitudes can perish before it reaches out our future generations. Section 2. Denji is not a creep. Understanding sexuality in media. For the purpose of this section, I will refer to Mineta as the creep character. Just so I can easily compare him to the second protagonist of this video, Chainsaw Man's Denji. First of all, unlike Mineta, Denji is not an external character. 
As the protagonist, he is in the inner circle of characters that make the story, that will be explored in depth so the viewer can understand and relate to them. His character is not comic relief. It's part of the core messaging and art of the author. Therefore, the audience will receive an explanation for all of the things he does, because Chainsaw Man is a better shonen compared to other titles, and Denji is not written to be a self-insert. Even his more relatable traits have a depth that is explicitly personalized to fit his story and character progression. He is a more viable character than Mineta, so claiming that they are similar is already a superficial argument that has no basis. The few similarities that they might have fade as soon as you read the first volume of Chainsaw Man. But still, I am committed to comparing them and showing how much they actually differ. So let's begin. Why do I believe that Denzi is not a creep? Point number one, he does not fit the creep mold. The creep is a character that objectifies women, of course, as they reduce them to their sexual appeal and they also go above and beyond to use them for their personal goals. The creep does not stop thinking of his female classmates as booty butts and they use force to get what they want, which is satisfying their deviant desires. And yes, any desires that crave non-consensual contact are deemed as deviant, because the lack of consent is what criminalizes unwanted touching. I am not talking about kink here, so please do not bring it into it, I do not have time to unpack that. So as I just said, the creep's efforts to satisfy themselves are persistent and unsolicited. Mineta constantly exhibits that behavior. He touches Froppy after she rescues him, he forces Momo to carry him and gets illicit pleasure out of it, he tries to peek into the girl's changing room and hot bath, and worst of all, he constantly makes remarks about how he plans to assault them. Denji really doesn't. Denji only touches power after a verbal agreement, which mostly entrapped him into almost dying. Is it ethical? Not really, but it's power and Denji we're talking about. Power takes advantage of Denji's wish to touch a girl, and then in the end Denji gets no pleasure out of it because touching outside mutual interest and intimacy ends up not being his thing. This is a lesson that little Denji had no time or role model to learn, so it gets delayed until this moment. When Denji touches Makima, it is her forcing herself on him, and she who has the power. I hope everyone understands that Denji was assaulted in that scene. No matter how much he wanted it, he was a 17-year-old boy being groomed by his grown-ass demon supervisor. Makima uses her sexual appeal and Denji's underdeveloped understanding of his own sexuality to lure him in and trust in her. Fujimoto was very clear about their exploitative relationship and the power imbalance that victimized Denji. With Himeno, we see a more aggressive form of harassment and SA. During the Eternity Devil arc, she uses his teenage curiosity by promising him a kiss, and then drunkenly forces herself on him. He refuses because ultimately Denji does not crave any female body coming his way, he craves intimacy and connection. And at the time, he thinks that Makima can offer him that. In fact, Denji is often the one who is intimately touched for nefarious reasons. Due to his desire to learn about intimacy with women, that leaves him vulnerable to manipulation by basically every female character, Makima, Reze, Himeno, Power. His victim home is sometimes underestimated or overlooked because of his gender and how it is portrayed. You see, becoming the sexual victim is often associated with being feminized, becoming a weak object that is powerless and needs to be saved. Male victims of SA also suffer from hegemonic patriarchal norms of masculinity. Men are expected to stand up against exploitation and defend themselves, because there is nothing worse than behaving like a quote-unquote woman in a situation like that. Remember that misogyny is not just hatred against women, it's hatred against human behavior associated with femininity. Therefore, men have to suffer from sexism too. Naturally, these harmful expectations don't prevent SA, and they contribute to victim-blaming attitudes being adopted by SA survivors, such as feeling ashamed for not being able to fight back. Society and conservative media ridicule men who openly speak about their experience of being victimized. This leads to male SA survivors being less likely to report their victimization to their family and to the authorities. It also doesn't help that what Makima does is grooming. Grooming is not always physically forceful, and the groomer often relies on emotionally manipulating a vulnerable person in order to get what they want, which means that people tend to disregard the notable scarring and trauma that the victim has to endure. Furthermore, when men fall victim to older individuals who groom them, they tend to feel special and that they have succeeded in fulfilling the masculine expectation to be sexually active. Only later in life do they realize how alienating such relationship was and how negatively it influenced their perception of romantic and sexual intimacy. It does not help how society encourages young boys to explore their sexual desires way younger than they allow girls to do so. 
Becoming sexually active and with an older woman is actually often encouraged by young boys' peers, their role models, and even their fathers. I personally had a classmate whose father openly bragged about taking him to a sex worker when he was only 16. So grooming victims are not only ridiculed when they come out with their stories, but a lot of the time they're not even considered victims by others and themselves. Finally, with Asa, we see Denji trying to explore a relationship dynamic with someone who has a similar social standing as him. He does not always like her, because no matter how hard Asa's devil Yoru tries to make her lure him in with fake interest, Asa has a persistent personality that comes out without much restraint. She says what's on her mind and has trouble focusing on the mission Yoru has set for her. Even when they kiss, it's actually Yoru catching Denji off guard and he does not reciprocate immediately. Asa does not want to exploit Denji, and on the other hand, Denji is incapable of exploiting anyone, because he is honest about his desires and never forces them onto people. Which leads me to the second point of this section. Point number two, Denji is a child. We get introduced to Denji when he was an orphan child living in extreme poverty and disadvantage, of course living alongside Pochida. He works for the Yakuza as a devil hunter, but works here is used very liberally. He's essentially a slave paying off his father's debt that never seems to end. He misses several organs, including an eye, a testicle and a kidney, and he has never received formal education or pedagogical socialization. He is an incomplete human. All he knows is, do as you're told and I'll pay you, which enables his exploitation and dehumanization. The way I see it, Denji being a half-human, half-devil in the story actually represents the concept of the lower socioeconomic class that is forced to dehumanize themselves for capitalist profit. The people who work day and night while being denied their basic rights and humanity in order to survive in the same world as the privileged. But anyway, that's who Denji is when we first meet him. We notice that his understanding of the world is very superficial. For example, he remarks how he heard it's normal to eat your bread with jam. He does not know why it's considered normal, but he wants to do it anyway so he can one day fit in with society. We're not told where he heard it from, but I can only assume that he was on television somewhere or he heard someone discussing their eating habits. Since he moves around, he probably caught glimpses of mainstream society. He probably has seen magazines, public television, streaming content, and people living their everyday lives. He is aware of the concept of having a girl over at his house, but he seems oblivious to the nuances surrounding relationships, which is not surprising as he has never had one. So from this information, I can deduce that his only exposure to women is through public media. Now, I don't want to repeat myself, but media's portrayal of women can be superficial at best and objectified at worst. Denji does not possess any hate against women because he is not raised in a patriarchal context that granted him power over people. However, he does have a very limited ability to differentiate between women in magazines and real-life women who he is not seen interacting with before his fusion with Pochita. I imagine the Yakuza is a very male-dominated industry. Nevertheless, his beliefs do not remain static. After he touches Power's boobs and feels nothing, and after he and Power become really close, Denji is seen understanding his sexuality better. His platonic, brotherly love for Power develops after she is traumatized by the Darkness Devil, and she developed an emotional dependence on Denji. She is constantly holding his hand, sleeping with him, and even bathing with him, entirely platonically. During the bath together, Denji remarks that it does not feel naughty at all. Even if he does not understand it, Power is Denji's first close family member and dependent, like a little sister that needs him to survive. Denji does not find that sexual, because such person cannot offer him the type of intimacy a girlfriend would. So we see here that Denji does not find every single woman's body sexually appealing and understanding the intimate context and nuances that are required to develop such desire. If Mineta was in Denji's situation, that relationship would be portrayed as a comedic opportunity for him to use Power's body. It's actually quite funny to think of Mineta in the Chainsaw Man manga because of the very different art style, but it would not be funny to have his creepy ass behaving like a degenerate. In addition, Mineta is a static character, and his entire purpose is being a pervert. He is nothing if not the creep, as he has no character arc and he could be entirely removed from the plot, with nothing changing in My Hero Academia's overarching like plot development. That's because Mineta is an unsavory joke that has no place in the 21st century, while Denji is a fleshed-out character whose journey we are following. To summarize, Denji is a child. Not quite literally, although 16 and 17 year olds are still legally children, 
but in the sense that, just like a child, his storyline is growing up, understanding himself, developing his personhood, and hopefully by the end, he will learn to defend his humanity. His relationship with sex, women, intimacy, and platonic love is still developing, and Fujimoto is handling it with respect, in my personal opinion. And finally, to end today's discussion, point number three, Denji is flawed, but he is not a creep. Of course, I will not ignore some of the legitimate reasons people might feel uncomfortable with Denji's character. I fully recognize my bias because I find him to be one of the most tragic and compelling characters in Shonen Jump, but I also am open to discussing the more unsavory traits Fujimoto gives him. So, Denji's personality does not create the most safe environment for women. He says creepy things like, I want to touch boobs, and he clearly expresses interest in sexual intimacy, like in chapter 1-7. to But that is not done to persuade any specific woman to be intimate with him. Even when he tells Asa that he wants to have sex, they go on to debate about whether sex is gross or not. He even says he wants to do it when he is older and gets a girlfriend. There is no intention to exploit Asa in this particular instance. But his lack of social boundaries prevents him from understanding how Asa might perceive it as such and become uncomfortable. At this point, I want to emphasize that in real life, if a man mentions sex to you in a random conversation that is not sexual or romantic and is supposed to be friendly or professional, then that probably has some, mm, well, underlying exploitative motives. Like, they probably are trying to test your boundaries and it's very justified that you would feel uncomfortable. But I just talked about how Denji's development is not the same as a regular human being that you would meet in the world around you. Another thing about Denji is that he often says things without thinking or to be sarcastic, like in chapter 1 to 8. In this chapter, Denji makes an unsavory joke about Asa directed at the falling devil. The devil asks him to surrender Asa so she can be eaten by the other devils. Denji essentially refuses by making a sarcastic remark along the lines of, can you at least save me her ass? Now, this is clearly quite gross and offensive, and I will not try to defend it. Nevertheless, I will maintain that Denji was mocking the falling devil, who underestimated him by thinking that he would give up Asa so easily. Denji has no intention to give her up, and when the devil asks him to do that, he decides to reply in a way to annoy his enemy. You might think I'm reaching here, and I do agree that it's not funny to ask for a girl's separate body part that will be theoretically detached from her body. But that type of sarcastic humor is very popular with shonen protagonists. Remember that in the end, it's a male shonen mangaka writing this story for a male shonen demographic that it has to appeal to. We have a long way to go before completely decommissioning sexist humor from shonen, but Chainsaw Man certainly differs from the more problematic works out there. It might appear that the sexualization of women and young girls in shonen will hopelessly continue and Japanese media have no intention of changing that. I mean, My Hero Academia is one of the most popular and mainstream titles out there, which can only mean that its fans will want to see more of it. Its mangaka, Horikoshi, made a conscious choice to sexualize some of the underage female cast and to include a character whose whole purpose is making them uncomfortable, and the fans are eating it up. Nevertheless, the world of shonen is changing, and new mangaka are trying to introduce works that are more introspective and appealing to the teenagers of the 21st century. A lot of these teenagers have read seinen like Berserk and Dorohedoro, they have watched Neon Genesis Evangelion and Ghost in the Shell, and they also enjoy shoujo anime manga such as Fruit Basket, Nana, Yona of the Dawn, among others. All of these works are of course flawed in their own way, and some of them continue to objectify women to some extent but they also introduced more humanized versions of female characters that played an active role in the story and subverted gender expectations. As I said earlier, the more animanga we consume that portray healthier interactions among characters and the deeper connections that we form as humans, the less we want to watch a teenage boy assault his classmates for laughs. Newer shonen authors, like Fujimoto, seem to understand that, as you can't deny that there has been some improvement in excluding such characters. Also, seriously guys, go read more shoujo, it has so many genres and compelling stories, and shoujo artists literally inspire some of the most popular seinen and shonen series out there. And that includes me, I need to be better at reading shoujo, I have not read as nearly as many stories as I need to and I want to, and I cannot continue to rewatch Revolutionary Girl Yetena until I die. Right? Okay, thank you so much for watching. If you watched till the end, oh my god, I appreciate you. And also, sorry for the shorter video today, I mean... There's a lot more to say about objectifying women and coercion in media, but 
I just wanted to compare Mineta and Denji for a second, just, you know, follow these calls online. Anyway, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll see you in the next one.